the information on vaccines for both patients and for parents. And as one of the first groups to get vaccine, um, when supplies were very limited, healthcare professionals and healthcare systems led the way with COVID-19 vaccination. And now that more vaccines are more available, including smaller packages for Pfizer that we've worked into getting out into pediatric and primary care offices, healthcare providers and healthcare systems are once again leading the way as they educate and encourage all of their patients to get vaccinated. From patients they see in the emergency departments to adolescents coming in for wellness checks. Health systems, including hospitals and medical groups play a critical role in vaccine access confidence and equity. Health systems have unique resources, have unique reach and a level of trust to leverage in this effort. And many health systems and associations have efforts already underway to contribute to the next phase of the vaccination efforts. So I'm really grateful to them for those efforts. One example is the American Medical Group Association reached out to its members to take action between now and Independence Day. These efforts included proactively educating and reaching out to patients, as we just heard about, partnering with community organizations, serving as a public vaccine ambassador, again, recurring themes, encouraging healthcare colleagues to get the vaccine. And within 36 hours of sending the request, 105 AMGMA, AMGA medical groups and health systems representing 74,000 physicians and 750 employees who care for 53 million patients committed to this effort. We also know that many hospitals are implementing best practices and we thank them for that as well and encourage all hospitals around the country to take up these efforts. These efforts include, but are not limited to, vaccinations upon discharge from the hospital, vaccinations at emergency departments, distributing shots to hospital affiliated primary care providers, encouraging hospitals to ramp up pop-up clinics, redoubling efforts on hospital fa uh, staff vaccine uptake. CDC has shared the following guidance just this last week to assist with these efforts, and that's called increasing access to vaccination opportunities, COVID-19 vaccination upon discharge from hospitals, emergency departments, and urgent care facilities. So with that, I have the great pleasure of introducing two panelists today, Dr. Mark Rosenberg, who's the president of the American College of Emergency Physicians and chair emeritus of the emergency medicine at St. Joseph's Health in Patterson, New Jersey, and Dr. Andrew Beidman, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Kaiser Permanente. So with that, I'd like to start with Dr. Rosenberg, um, if you would. Dr. Rosenberg, can you tell us about St. Joseph's efforts to provide vaccinations upon discharge from your emergency departments? These are complex settings. How were you able to make that work? Well, thanks for having me, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about St. Joseph's Health and this initiative and, and the results of the initiative. I um, have to know a little bit about St. Joseph's Health. It is a mission-driven healthcare system in northern New Jersey dedicated to providing health equity to its entire community. And this is evidenced by the fact that St. Joe's had a community-focused pandemic response. And it can happen without the support of every level of the hospital and the organization. So this all started at the C-suite uh, with our CEO, Kevin Slavin, our chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Joe Duffy, who allowed the staff in the emergency department and throughout the hospital to provide innovative direct care to everybody in the community that needed it. The ED became an integral part of the care. Part of the concern was that many people in Patterson, New Jersey, um, would came to the emergency department in part for primary care. So we started giving shots in the emergency department uh, for uh, discharge patients, and we used the single shot. We used uh, the J&J &J vaccine because it made things so much easier to accomplish without as much follow-up. Of course, we'd always try transition to care initiatives to get them back to their primary care doc. Not only did we do this in the emergency department, but we looked at those, air, those communities that were underserved by zip code. And we put together vaccine efforts uh, to not only take care of patients in that, those communities that were underserved, 
uh, with whatever it would take, but with centers or uh, mobile vehicles, uh, but also at home or in nursing homes if that was necessary. The results of this program are absolutely unbelievable. All in all, uh, almost 80,000 shots were given to date. This data is from yesterday. Uh, the chief, the person in charge of this vaccine program was Linda Reed, who made it all possible for this to happen in the emergency department and in the community. But when I spoke with her yesterday before, uh, when I was planning to be here today, I said, what's your secret sauce? And we said it multiple times today. And she says, it takes a village. And that's what we had. So um, it was just an amazing effort and so proud to be here to talk about this. Thank you, Dr. Wolinski. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenberg. Um, Dr. Beinman, um, on Tuesday, June 8th, as part of the National Month of Action, Kaiser Permanente announced a new patient vaccine re outreach effort. How are you, can you tell us about it and how are you able to make it work? Well, Dr. Walensky, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. And let me just start by saying how pleased I am to see the steps you've been taking to restore scientific integrity at the CDC. Kaiser Permanente has been really pleased to be a part of the National Month of Action Sprint to vaccinate 70% of adults in the United States against COVID-19 with at least one shot by July 4th. And as an integrated delivery system, Kaiser Permanente has been able to leverage our sophisticated electronic health record, digital tools, and coordinated efforts across our care continuum to create patient-centric strategies to increase the number of vaccinated members and in the public. With our scale and extensive experience in population health, uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, aims to boost vaccine confidence with a multi-pronged approach, uh, really to try to reach targeted populations. Uh, for example, we use our electronic record system uh, to identify and reach out to eligible but unvaccinated people. And we do this using culturally relevant emails, mailings, and texts to encourage uh, vaccination. Uh, you know, messages are tailored to individuals and populations and use a variety of messengers, including our providers, as we've talked about in the last sessions. We use our employees who reflect the people uh, in the community. You know, and then when, when our patients and our members come into the, the office, uh, what we do is we make sure that physicians are prompted to discuss vaccination in a personalized uh, venue. Um, and uh, we use that same electronic health record to batch the emails and secure messages so that a primary care physician can send out those messages to their own patient panel. And we particularly target this uh, to um, high vaccine uh, hesitant communities where we believe that personalized touch can really make a difference. And uh, we, you know, we have been piloting uh, using text uh, in addition to email because we think that maybe just by cl clicking on a link in a text, it might um, reach some people who might not otherwise uh, be, be responsive. Another thing we've been doing is that when patients come to our facilities, including our pharmacies and our labs, we have posters uh, conveniently located throughout our facilities with QR codes that basically allow individuals to access our vaccine clinics and see immediately where they can come in and get a vaccine on a walk-in basis. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible uh, to get a vaccine. And we're also doing a lot of work in the communities where we are. So as part of the National Month of Action Sprint, we launched a robust acceleration plan beginning June 4th that's included um, an additional $10 million in community grants that we've provided to 100 community-based organizations to pr uh, promote vaccine confidence messages and engage organizations such as churches, schools, and other uh, trusted community hubs. This, this $10 million is on top of an investment we had already made of $25 million in nearly 200 community-based uh, organizations to increase vaccine access and build confidence in high-risk populations. We've also uh, created something called we call the immunity, uh, with an emphasis on unity sweepstakes. 
It's open to anyone age 12 or older who's been vaccinated by Kaiser Permanente or all vaccinated Kaiser Permanente members, regardless of where they got vaccinated. And this sweepstakes basically encourages vaccination while also supporting a full and healthy return to, uh, to life's activities. Uh, we have a thousand people who will be uh, uh, reward winners, and these will include things like wellness retreats, healthy home meal deliveries, personal training equipment, gym memberships, and family trips to theme parks and national parks. And in the community, we're really relying on the use of uh, social media campaigns with uh, influencers that are relevant for those communities. So. Uh, we're reaching out to uh, particularly 18 to 30 year olds through these campaigns, delivering relevant messages from trusted voices and social influencers. Uh, we're doing this also uh, with existing partners, including the Cloud9 eSports organization. Finally, I, I just want to point out that we've created a toolkit at Kaiser Permanente that we have made available publicly. It's available on our website and it's focused on improving vaccine access and equity and um, trying to highlight really some of the approaches that we think have worked in our own setting. Uh, and um, in that toolkit, we identify seven archetypes among the population eligible to be, be vaccinated, uh, ranging from vaccine advocates to some steadfast opponents. And we try to provide concrete tactics for reaching each of those groups. And as I said, it's available on our website and we hope it will be used by others and will be found to be helpful as we try to contribute to this dialogue as you're doing here today to really uh, reach as many people as possible. Great, Th thank you to you both. I, you know, I think what this discussion really highlights is um, how each setting may be unique and that there's so much extraordinary work that can be done in each. Dr. Rosenberg telling us 80,000 people who are reached um, and you know, through a really complex setting like the emergency departments, but using a simple to use vaccine, the J&J that really only requires one dose, really having equity at the focus. Um, and then also Dr. Beinman, your, your ability to leverage, um, leverage uh, digital tools to um, do outreach and, and make sure that you're, you're um, doing that outreach that's um, tailored to individuals. Um, as well as incentive programs. So, uh, so many lessons that we can learn as we take this in moving forward. But building on all of this, um, I would just like to encourage all health systems to reach out to as many patients as you can and in, in any different way that you can to make sure we learn the lesson from Dr. Rosenberg to engage all stakeholders. If you wanna do this in the emergency department, you may need to, re you do need to reach out to your C-suite and get help. Work with community-based organizations on expanding vaccine access in vulnerable communities. Sign up to vaccinate at your group practice, at your group or practice um, if you haven't already, and then encourage healthcare employee colleagues to get the vaccine themselves if they haven't already. So thank you for this discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Beinman, for these important lessons you're teaching us. And now I will pass things over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Dr. Walensky. Um, I have the real pleasure to welcome and have a discussion with Dr. Lee Beers, who's a, a neighbor here in Washington, D.C., a pediatrician and a president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a professor of pediatrics and the medical director for the Community Health and Advocacy at Children's National Hospital. And our focus today is how we can increase COVID-19 vaccine uptake among a very important group namely adolescents. To set the stage, let us look at some data on COVID-19 in children in the United States. So, so far, there have been more than 3.3 million COVID-19 cases and 314 deaths in people younger than 18 years of age, according to the CDC. The CDC recently published data on COVID-19 adolescent hospitalization rates. The rates, thankfully, were very low, about two per 100,000 at their peak. However, among hospitalized adolescents, nearly one third required admission to an intensive care unit and 5% required invasive mechanical ventilation. And about 30% of these children had no underlying conditions that were recognizable. You've all heard 
of the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. So far, there have been more than 4,000 cases reported to the CDC. And in a recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, reporting on MISC cases in 26 states, 73% had previously been healthy children. Long COVID has also been seen in adolescents and other younger patients. So I'm gonna be talking to Dr. Beers and asking her about her experience in this regard. The bottom line is that COVID-19 in pediatric patients, although rare with regard to serious complications, definitely can be very serious. And the good news is that COVID-19 vaccine have proven to be very safe and effective, including in younger people. The Pfizer vaccine is already approved for people ages 12 and older. In a large clinical trial, that vaccine had 100% efficacy in adolescents 12 to 15. Similar results were reported with Moderna vaccine who yesterday, June 10th, applied to the FDA for emergency use authorization for adolescents 12 to 17 years. And so we made some good progress in vaccinating adolescents. 23.4% for children aged 12 to 15 and 38.6% of children aged 16 to 17 years have received at least one dose of vaccine. The Biden administration has worked to improve adolescent vaccine uptake, such as with webinars and listening sessions with pediatric education and other adolescent focused associations following FDA authorization and ACIP recommendation. But clearly more needs to be done. And actually that's what we're gonna talk about with Dr. Beers. So welcome, Dr. Beers. It's great to see you. It's great to be with you. It's a real pleasure. So let me ask you, as a pediatrician who talks with other pediatricians all over the country about their experience, what are the most compelling reasons for adolescents to get vaccinated? And in this regard, what have you seen with long COVID and other serious sequela in adolescents? Well, thank you so much for that. And, and really just echoing the thanks others have shared for, for your partnership and for the administration's partnership. We're, we're really honored to be here with you today. Um, you know, and it, it's such an important question and it's one that we hear a lot, right? And, and in my mind, there's really, really three key issues that, that compel me to, to recommend vaccine for, for adolescents. And in fact, give, given my own adolescents, their vaccines, I have a 12 and 16 year old at home. So, you know, and I think, think three key things. First is that, as you just pointed out, that vaccine, you know, COVID infection in children and adolescents really is not benign. I, I think we've been very grateful um, that children don't seem to be impacted by the infectious complications of COVID to the same degree as adults, but they are still impacted and they can still get, get quite ill. Um, and if we have a safe and effective vaccine to prevent that, well, we, we absolutely want to do that. I think the second reason is, you know, the other impacts of COVID, the other impacts of the pandemic have really had a disproportionate impact on, on the children of our country. They, they really, they've borne so much of this uh, for us. Their school's been disrupted, their sports, their activities, their, their friendships, their social networks have been disrupted. And, and getting vaccinated is a really important way to get everyone back back to that. There was a, a study released just today, actually, that there was an increase uh, in suicidal attempts over the past year for young women, uh, teenage women presenting to the emergency department. And so this is, this is you know, right. very real. Um, and I think the third thing, and, and actually this is, this is one of the things I hear from my, my kids and their, their friends, is that there's a, a sense of community obligation and service in getting the vaccine. I, I think our young people um, know that, that when they get vaccinated, they're helping to decrease the spread of COVID uh, within the community. And, and, and that, I think, is a really important thing. Uh, and and you, you also asked about long COVID, um, you know, and I think, you know, it, you, you know this better 
more than anybody. We we don't, uh, you know, there, there's lots we still don't know about COVID. And and when I I talk to pediatricians across the country, I, I you mentioned, I mean, I just have this great honor, and I'm I really uh, to be able to represent over sixty thousand pediatricians across the country. And and what I hear from them is that they are seeing kids in their practice every day, uh, every week who who have had COVID and who are having lingering symptoms. Um, and I think we're still getting our arms around the data on that. But what what I'm hearing from pediatricians across the country is that that that's a very real thing and that and that kids are are having prolonged symptoms um and and just one more reminder how important it is to to really be protecting our young people and vaccinating them with the safe and effective vaccine as it's available well thank you for that really really wonderful answer i i'm very impressed by the aspect dr beers that we talk about a lot and it, it's good to hear from you about your children, your your two your two teenagers, about their appreciation for the community responsibility, um, because you know we talk to them about the fact that indeed, as I've mentioned, we can get children can get seriously ill, even though the the incidence of that occurring compared to the elderly, for example, is much less. It still be can it still can be serious, but the idea that your children um realize the communal the communal imp importance of it so how did that conversation go just to give people an idea did they come to you and say mom we'd like to get vaccinated do you nudge them a little bit and say by the way should you get vaccinated how does the conversation go i've had three teenage girls a long time ago they're no longer teenage and i'm kind of wondering how that would go today if they were teenagers so how did the conversation start <laughs> Well, that's it. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I, my kids may be in a unique situation, so maybe I'll tell you about my kids, and then also what their friends are saying to my my <laughs> husband is also a pediatrician, and and uh, you know, with this role and work from home, I I think my kids have overheard more about COVID and the COVID vaccine than than probably most adolescents their age. So 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 I think they started with a good baseline knowledge, but but I will tell you, they came to me. You know, they it, it actually started. Um, well, I would say it started with a conversation even before the vaccine was available to any of us. And my 16-year-old said, you know, mom, are there any vaccine trials near us? I'd like to be in a vaccine trial. Um, and so that led to some, some additional conversations. Uh, and, and they both, you know, when the vaccine was available, they said, when can, when can you sign us up? Um, my, you know, my son uh, is 12, and so he was more recently available, and he's been counting the days until the, the day he's fully vaccinated. So I, I think they're really enthusiastic about it. But, you know, I, you know, when I talk to my patients or to, to friends or others who, who, who have kids who aren't growing up in a household where we're talking about this all the time, um, you know, I think a lot of it is about getting back to the things they used to do, getting back to full in-person school and getting back to sports and being with your friends. And lots of the questions my daughter asks are, okay, mom, can we go to a movie theater now? Um, can, can we take, you know, can I go on the metro? Can we, you know, so a lot of it is really about getting back to to the things that they love to do and that they want to do um, with, without worry and without hesitation. Terrific. Well, let's go to the other side of that coin, Dr. Beers, and that has to do with vaccine hesitancy. One of the things that we are concerned about, obviously, is that there is a degree of vaccine hesitancy that we have to address. And in interactions with patients and their families that you have, do you often encounter vaccine hesitancy? And what are the, some of the concerns that parents and maybe even the children have, for example, in your clinic and in your practice? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, you're, you're very right. I and mean, just as with adults, adolescents have vaccine hesitancy and, and, and parents have vaccine hesitancy for their kids. And I think, you know, there, there's a couple different groups, I would say, almost. Um, you know, there are our parents and teens who just just have questions that they need to have answered. They're they're sort of on the fence, and they think they might want to do it, but but they're they're not sure. They've heard just you know conflicting information, and they want the opportunity to ask some questions. and And I think those are you know, gosh, you know, some of the panelists earlier talked about how just having those conversations in your practice are so important um, to to really reaching families who who may just have a few questions. 
you know, I think there are other families who, who have more specific questions. I think some of the most common things I hear are concerns about, you know, how the, the speed of which the vaccine became available or whether or not um, we have enough experience with it in kids. And I think, um, you know, those are things we're able to talk through and again, answer those questions um, very honestly and transparently. And I, I think, uh, you know, I think the general public knows more about the vaccine development process than ever before um, in, in probably any of our lifetimes. <laughs> Um, and then I think there's this whole other bucket of um, misinformation and, and that in some ways, sometimes that's easier to deal with, sometimes that's harder, right? Um, and so I think, you know, some of the misinformation that's out there about, um, uh, you know, vaccines causing infertility or, or other, other things that, that we just know aren't true. And so really, um, again, I think maybe it was Dr. Jones earlier said, I just ask patients, what, what, what are their questions? What have they heard? Um, and, and so asking about those things and and then talking through through you know why we're not worried about those things without of course reinforcing the the misinformation we have we have to be careful to do that too and I, I think you know unfortunately social media is is powerful and there's a lot of misinformation on social media and our our adolescents are on social media a whole lot um, and so they see the good stuff but they also see the misinformation there great so we'll have time for one last question that I have to ask you since you are the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, could you just tell us uh, what are some of the initiatives that the AAP and Children's Hospital are involved in? Uh, thank you for that. I would love to. You know, I think uh, uh, vac vaccines in general is something that pediatricians have been doing for a long time, and so uh, so so we we thought about this a lot. And when when this when when the COVID vaccine came up and came available for adolescents, we were really ready to jump in. So I would say a couple things that I'd love to highlight: um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a campaign called "Call Your Pediatrician for Parents." Um, we've got fun PSAs and and social media tags and articles on our our HealthyChildren.org website um, that that you can push out and really encourage parents to call their pediatricians, um, both for questions about the COVID vaccine, but also, you know, get back in for your well visit and get caught up on your other routine immunizations as well. Um, some of the things I'd love to highlight uh, and the wor our work at Children's National, actually a really um, terrific partnership that we had with DC Public Schools. Uh, and we partnered together with DC Public Schools actually before the vaccine was authorized in adolescents because we really wanted to make sure the teachers were vaccinated and felt comfortable going back to school. And so we partnered with them, um, went down to Dunbar High School here in DC and, and had a couple really big uh, days where we brought, brought teachers in to help them get immunized. Uh, and I tell you, it was just you know, I I was down there. Lots of my colleagues were down there, and it was it was just one of the most joyful things uh, that we had done all year, uh, and and it was really really a special opportunity. Terrific, terrific, wonderful. Well, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot in our medical response team, particularly among the community core concept, is trusted messengers, and without a doubt, your physician, your family physician, is a trusted messenger, and among those. Clearly, pediatricians rank very high among them. So keep up your great work. Uh, we really do need what you all are doing. So thank you very much, Dr. Beers. It's a real pleasure speaking with you. And now let me just turn it over now to Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. And good day to everyone. Thanks so much for joining and so appreciate what each one of you is really doing you know, in your practices, in your organizations, just to get the entire country vaccinated. I'm so looking forward to my conversation today with Dr. Kanini Rodney, who is the Deputy Associate Chief of Staff at the Birmingham VA. And we're gonna talk some uh, about equity, which, you know, everyone has mentioned because we know it needs to be at the center. So I'm just gonna take a, a couple moments for reflection and then launch into discussion with Dr. Rodney. And as I look around here, I, I think we, all feel that urgency when it comes to equity, that we know we have to find those solutions. We're hearing about them today that will work for every community. We have to have everyone benefiting. At this time, the vaccine is the, the best tool that we have in our, in our toolbox. Certainly for the Biden-Harris administration, centering equity in the COVID-19 response and recovery has been top of priority. And I know that's, that's shared. The reality, and we know it all too well in this past year, and we've known it for decades and beyond, when we're in a time of national crisis, 
it is all too predictable every time which groups will be hit the first and hit the hardest. And for many communities, black and brown communities, other communities of color, for rural communities, for many other groups, people with disabilities, those in the LGBTQ plus family, you know, and yet others, these groups are all overrepresented in the burden of COVID-19. So cases and hospitalizations and tragically in death and loss of life. Yet underrepresented when it comes time to benefit from scientific discovery, be it testing or therapies, and of course, today's conversation, vaccination. We have to acknowledge the social realities, you know, the structural drivers, really the limited access to resources and opportunity over generation that play such a key role in this. And also to acknowledge the earned distrust, quite frankly, of medical institutions and, and the government. So these are just some of the unique considerations in the equity space. And while we acknowledge them, we have to address them. And so my gratitude is deep. Everyone is doing so much now to advance equity in this moment. We cannot let up. It's going to take the creativity, the innovation that we're hearing about. It's going to be hyper-local. For sure, we have to bring vaccine to people. We have to do it in partnership, collaborations, the investment of our time. People have all talked about that. We have to connect everyone with information, as well as making sure vaccination is just easy, 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 and convenient and identifying and removing all of the potential structural barriers, things like making sure there's paid time off transportation and childcare, just priorities and always meeting people where they are. Forum like this just cannot be replaced. This opportunity to share with one another, now a practicing internal medicine physician as well, what's working, also where we see persistent challenges and just try to solve for them together. So, I'm so, so looking forward to these next moments in conversation with you, Dr. Rodney, because your leadership has been just tremendous in this space. You know, you're a board certified internal medicine physician in leadership at the Birmingham VA. You are also a women's health medical director and so relevant to today's conversation. You're leading the COVID-19 vaccine initiative there, and you've got the key responsibility for operations and outreach. So lots to learn from you today, to learn with you today. So welcome, Dr. Rodney. Thank you so much, Dr. Nanina Smith, for the warm introduction and for inviting me to participate in this conversation today. And I wanna thank you for your extraordinary work um, that you've been doing all along, as well as what you're doing with the White House COVID-19 response team. So again, thank you for having me. Um, I think everyone has played a role or and has to play a role in stemming the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm honored that my executive leadership at the Birmingham VA chose me to lead our efforts there, our local efforts. Um, our VA serves a diverse population of over 68,000 veterans. And our veterans are spread out with the, over 24 counties across Alabama, the northern and um, central areas of, North, of Alabama. And so it's a diverse population in terms of ethnicity, in terms of um, geographic location, and so that also makes it a challenge in terms of, um, you know, planning out a, uh, a, stra a strategies that will affect all of those um, populations. So we started really fairly early in, in, in December um, by vaccinating first our employees, and then we went to our high risks, quickly moved to our high risk population. And by January, we realized that, you know, we were running out of space. Um, and so use an offsite location where we were easily vaccinating 500 to 1,000 people a day. Um, at one day, we even reached 1,100, and that was very exciting for us and very exciting for the team to have uh, accomplished that. And while we were doing that, we were also training and preparing our outpatient locations to take on that challenge as well, our rural-located uh, clinical um, community outpatient clinics. So we invested in planning early, um, but we also knew that we had to take action very quickly. Absolutely. You know, and I think what we what we need to get into is I think a reality that you probably have faced in Birmingham. We certainly have seen it in the federal vaccination channels that those who were most eager got vaccinated kind of first and as soon as they could. Uh, and I think we anticipated that that's reflected in that kind of hitting 1100 in a day, as you mentioned, 
So we know it's going to take a little bit more intention in this next phase to reach everyone. Can you talk for a bit about how your vaccine efforts, both operations and outreach, have really evolved or changed since, since those first early days on the inception? Yeah, I mean, I think like most of uh, the healthcare systems, um, the challenges they're facing right now, we move from a highly centralized, high volume approach to now using a far more decentralized, low volume clinics across our catchment areas. And that may involve pop-up clinics in collaboration with local community agencies and community organizations. And, uh, and our outreach also has shifted, right? It's shifted from being broad global messages to what others have mentioned in the panel discussions already to targeted intentional efforts. And we use every single modality that was at our disposal. So whether it was mail or email, text messages, uh, print media, social media, um, you know, through health fairs. And then most importantly, we use the voice of our veterans. So those who have been vaccinated, um, using their voices uh, to help other veterans to get vaccinated. And then the voice of our, um, of our providers as we're talking about today. So those are the kinds of shifts that we have to make. And I'd say the biggest overarching change is that our philosophy and strategies move from providing a single product, which is the vaccine, uh, to providing a service. So one that requires building trust, capitalizing on relationships, and removing barriers so that the veterans feel safe and confident about getting their vaccines in their local communities. And so we've opened up access to space it to our spouse to veteran spouses, caregivers, um, and as mentioned before, also to adolescents 12 to 17 years old as well. That's really fantastic. So with that, and I think that that's exactly the kind of creativity and change of frame, right? Thinking about providing a service. Let me ask you specifically about how you're reaching out to those groups that really traditionally have been marginalized, you know, have been medically underserved, have had difficulty accessing healthcare services. What have you been able to do there? Yeah, so we have been closely monitoring um, our efforts all along. So it's pretty easy for us to identify our high risk populations and those with lower vaccine rates. Um, and just as we did with our outreach efforts, we really cast a very wide net, right? Because our, our strategies had to be, we thought, multi-pronged and, and we had to do them simultaneously uh, in order to, to get to the various pockets of underserved and upper, underrepresented. And our strategies range from overcoming issues with access to evidence-based information, as others have talked about, and addressing vaccine concerns to overcoming things like mobility and transportation and, and other socioeconomic um, barriers. And it has meant working closely with our community partners and local agencies and having individual or small group conversations to meet veterans where they are in the vaccine spectrum and working with them to move from vaccine hesitancy to deliberation to acceptance and then to action. And I think other panelists have talked about that as well. Um, I can give you some specific examples of some of the groups that we focused on, you know, keeping in mind that an individual may fit in more than one category. Um, so we sent out, for example, vaccination teams to the homes of our homebound veterans um, so that they could get vaccinated as well as their spouses and caregivers. Um, we have done public service announcements um, with our featuring our black veterans who receive uh, vaccinations and then using those to inform others in the community. Um, I have personally been involved in um, black civic organizations where we've increased awareness around COVID vaccine and discussed um, the myths and the facts around the vaccine um, and educated each other about um, the vaccine itself. Uh, June this month is um, LGBTQ Pride Month. And so there has been a lot of outreach um, specifically to this community um, this month. And we have a health fair that's coming up on June 25th and we'll obviously be offering the vaccine at that time as well. Um, one of our biggest challenges is our rural veterans, uh, creating opportunities for them to get vaccinated locally and most importantly, creating safe spaces for open dialogue about the vaccine perspectives and you know, ensuring that they have the right facts so they can make um, the decisions for themselves. 
And so, as I mentioned before, we have trained um, providers and nurses, um, pharmacists, et cetera, in those local uh, clinics to provide those vaccines. And that is being done and has been um, very successful in our seven um, smaller clinics. And we are actually about to launch a public service announcement, another PSA that features the local nurses and physicians in that community, because obviously they're the trusted um, voices in their community. Um, another population that is amongst the most vulnerable and hard to reach is our homeless. And so we have a homeless team that goes out into the community, to the shelters. They partner with agencies such as Hudvash, um, and that has been tremendously ex uh, successful as well. Um, and then the last group is our women veterans. And this is one of our largest, um, our fastest growing population. Um, about 10% of our uh, veterans nationally are women veterans. And in, uh, in Birmingham, we have close to 9,000 women. So definitely has been a focus for us. Uh, I think somebody has already mentioned about um, uh, some of the challenges that our women face. Um, you know, this is something that um, they have to consider not just for themselves, but uh, potentially um, having the discussion about what this means for their fertility, what this means for passing on genetic mutations to their offspring. And so those are the kinds of conversations and challenges um, that we need to have and uh, to disassemble some of the myths that are in our, in our community. And so we hosted a um, COVID-19 chit chat for maternity veterans and women of reproductive age, um, where we had um, a group of experts that came to really listen, uh, to engage, to discuss. Um, and, and, and you mentioned before Dr. Nina Smith about acknowledging um, you know, the fears, especially of black and, uh, and brown um, Americans because of historical injustices. And those historical injustices have been um, reinforced by uh, sometimes daily uh, discrimination and microaggressions. And so, you know, we have to be respectful of that and know that, um, you know, this is a reality of a large uh, segment of our population. And coming from that framework, you know, engaging in a conversation, uh, really um, opening up the dialogue and listening to people. Um, and then they will in turn listen to you and to listen to uh, the facts that you have to share with them and, and be able to consider that in their decision-making. Um, so I'm, I am really happy and, and reassured that there are clinical professionals like you that have been on the forefront of this because I know that part of your career has always been about equity and dismantling structural uh, barriers that black and brown people have to, to cancer screenings, to diabetes, to you know, other, other um, uh, other diseases other than COVID. And I think that when you frame this as um, creating equity and access to healthcare and not just one disease entity, then people are um, more likely to engage with you because they believe that you're truly concerned about them and not just about the disease. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Rodney. <laughs> just terrific all around. The multi-pronged approach, approach, fabulous insights there. I just cannot underscore what you said. Uh, just now enough that people are looking to know that we are all committed and interested in their health holistically beyond COVID and just the vaccine. And that's so key in, in equity. So you're, you're doing just so much and it really is inspiring. It's made me very hopeful, very optimistic. You know, you take a stance of respect, intentionality um, and, and, and urgency and you're making substantial progress there in, in Birmingham. Um, and we together can, right, on vaccination equity, but certainly on health equity more broadly to your point. I'm so grateful to have been in conversation with you today. Just appreciate you and everything you're doing. Um, thank you so much. And so with that, I, I will pause on our conversation and pass the baton on to my tremendous colleague, Dr. Bashara Shukar. Bashara, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Nunez-Smith. And, um, you know, for primary care providers to actually vaccinate in their offices, it takes collaboration between the healthcare system and the health department. So I'm really thrilled to have the last two panelists here with us today, uh, Dr. Angela Marshall, who runs a comprehensive women's health practice in Silver Spring, uh, Maryland, and Dr. Bruce Vanderhoff, who's the chief medical officer at the Ohio uh, Department of Health. 
And Angela, I'm going to just start with you right away. I had the opportunity to go visit with you in your office, got to talk to your staff. And you have been part of this Maryland primary care vaccine effort that has 375 practices that are vaccinating in their offices. So just tell me a little bit about your outreach effort and how you've engaged with your patients who haven't been vaccinated and what kind of results have you been seeing? Well, first, let me say how proud I am of the state of Maryland for trailblazing in the healthcare space. A few years ago, Maryland piloted a statewide primary care program that's been hugely successful at organizing all of our primary care resources so that we can better care for our patients. And as we all know, the pandemic created such an incredible strain on our healthcare system, but because this infrastructure was already in place, we were able to organize and mobilize more effectively. And when we realized that there were significant disparities in our vaccination rates for certain populations, we were able to utilize the state program to open additional avenues for vaccinations, which were the primary care offices. And this strategy proved to be extremely helpful for our patients particularly those who are unable to access vaccines at the retail sites or at the mass vaccination sites. And it was especially helpful for those who are hesitant to get vaccinated. And most importantly, one of the things that we discovered very quickly was that many patients, not surprisingly, felt more comfortable getting vaccinated in their medical homes which are often the primary care offices. And so with this program, since its inception on March 15th, there have been more than 110,000 patients vaccinated in the primary care offices within the state, which helped to significantly augment the other mass vaccination efforts that are ongoing in the state. That is so wonderful. And my understanding from that visit is you literally get a list of patients who haven't been vaccinated yet, your staff or yourself pick up the phone and talk to them. Maybe in one minute, what kind of advice do you have for physicians who are on this, um, watching this right now, who are interested in doing this type of outreach? Well, at the start of our efforts, we really tried to tailor all of our outreach efforts to our patient needs. And for example, many of our seniors had expressed frustration with some of the web-based sign-up links that required quick action and sometimes expired before they could act on them. So instead of using a web-based strategy, we called our patients. And some of those calls were done by live people in our office, and some were done by recorded messages that were essentially robocalls. And I'm happy to say that our efforts seem to have paid off. As of yesterday, 72% of our patients have received their first dose of their COVID vaccines, and 66% have received a second dose. And for our African-American patients, we've had 69% receive their first dose and 63% receive their second dose, which I think is a great start. That is just so wonderful. Thank you, um, uh, Angela. Uh, Bruce, the Ohio Department of Health has actually taken a few steps to make it easy to actually provide vaccines to providers' offices. What are like the two or three um, steps that the health department in Ohio taken to make it easy to get the vaccines to doctors' offices? Well, I think we recognize that much of what was needed to achieve rapid, high volume vaccine delivery in large vaccine clinics had actually become an impediment to vaccine delivery in primary care. So we took a number of steps that were really aimed at supporting our primary care providers. First, we're using a highly specialized distribution center to deliver vaccine to primary care practices in packages of as few as 30 doses. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the vaccine actually arrives from the manufacturer in packages of over 1,100 or more recently 450. But 30 doses is a more practical shipment size for many primary care providers. We can now deliver these smaller packages same day, and we're transitioning the order process directly to the primary care offices rather than going through perhaps a health department so providers can better manage their supply based on their own demand. Secondly, we're realigning our provider requirements to better support primary care, recognizing that continuity care is different 
than care at a mass vac site. So providers can now offer vaccines routinely in their practices without the expectation of rapid administration. You know, previously we required everyone to begin administration within 24 hours of receipt and then to give every dose within seven days. Our providers are also being urged to never miss an opportunity to vaccinate, even if it means some doses won't get used. So the bottom line is we want and we need to support our primary care providers in their efforts to get vaccines to more Ohioans. And these are just some important steps in that effort. Yeah, that, thank you for bringing the issue of the importance of focusing on not missing an opportunity to vaccinate um, a, a patient when they're there in your office. I know the wastage issue has been a concern because we were at the time where we all want to make sure we're leveraging every dose possible and we need to continue to do that, but we don't want to do that at the expense of providing the opportunity for one of our patients to be able to get vaccinated. Um, last question to you, Dr. Vanderhoff. What advice do you have for other state or local health departments to be engaged in this type of efforts to make vaccines available at primary care doctor's offices? Well, based on our experience, I'd offer the following ideas. Uh, first, engage primary care providers from the start. They know firsthand what the challenges and opportunities are with vaccination in their practices. And even well-intentioned efforts to support them will fall flat if they aren't part of that planning. Secondly, I think once you engage them, you need to be willing to really listen to them. We had a number of assumptions about vaccine delivery based on our experience with large vaccination sites that posed a real problem for primary care practices. And we had to be willing to really accept some constructive criticism and take a hard look at what we could do differently to support primary care. And finally, I think it's important to have a can-do attitude that assumes responsibility for addressing obstacles, even if it feels like those might be beyond your control. We had to just get past our frustration that manufacturers weren't shipping vaccine in the quantities we wanted before we could innovate our state warehouse solution. It wasn't easy, but our willingness to own the solution led to real innovation of which now I think we're very proud and to some real enhancement in the delivery of care in, in Ohio. Thank you to you both. I mean, this is the type of practical um, examples of things we need to do to be able to make vaccines more and more conveniently available to people through our primary care provider offices. Um, you know, obviously, um, we are at a point now in our vaccination effort where it's all about the ground game. It is about going community by community, zip code by zip code, census track by census track. It's about understanding the type of strategies that would make a difference so that those folks who still have questions about the vaccines have their questions answered and then they can build their confidence. They can make an informed decision to be able to get vaccinated. And I can't uh, thank you enough for all the work everybody who's watching, everybody who's participated about the significant role that primary care providers and health systems have to play in this effort. So my call to action here, if you're a primary care provider who's already vaccinating in your offices, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're not vaccinating in your office, please take a moment. CDC offers all the resources and toolkits to support you to sign up to become vaccinators. So please check that, uh, that out and, and get engaged and be a vaccinator. Uh, also, please take a moment. We have a sense of urgency here to pick up the phone, talk to your patients, send them text messages, emails, letters for those who haven't been vaccinated. And as we've heard from all of our panelists, that one-on-one -on -one conversations make a huge difference. So please take a moment to do that. And also make sure you're very vocal about educating your, not just your patients, but your community, be engaged on social media and regular local interviews. All of that would make a difference. And let's not forget that we continue to encourage our colleagues and our own practices to get vaccinated if they have not been vaccinated. So I wanna take a moment to thank all of our um, uh, participants today, the panelists, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Walensky, Dr. Murthy, uh, Dr. Nunez-Smith, all the audience today for everything you've done and for everything we will all continue to do to get more and more people vaccinated 
by July 4th. So thank you so much and have a great rest of the day.